it's, it's a real honor to be here. Um, we're getting started. I'd like to ask a question. Anybody here that does not drink coffee regularly, raise your hand. Well, that's got rid of a lot of people. Keep your hands up. Have you ever gone to the grocery store and bought that icing, you know, to put on cupcakes or something? And you, Okay, have you ever bought a energy bar of some kind to use for your hikes? Okay, hands down. So I think I got everybody, didn't I? What that means is, is that there's something that all of us can do, and we'll get back to that. Let's see, make sure everything works here. Come on. Maybe this isn't turned on. It's not changing for me, did I? The next slide is an audience participation slide, so it has to work. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> well, yeah, we can get to it that way, maybe. Okay, what kind of bird is this? I know there are people who know what this is. It's a thrush. What kind? No, it's not a hermit. What's the other kind that you might find here? That's a Swainson's thrush. I heard someone say it. So where does the Swainson's thrush live? Now, I'll, I'll make that question rhetorical. Um, this is a quote from this fine book, and I know that the author's here, but uh, damp wooded habitat of montane forests. However, uh, if you, according to my introduction, if you ask me on the street somewhere, where do Swainson's thrushes live? I would guess that I've probably seen thousand or more in the last 10 and 15 years. And obviously, if I've seen that many, I haven't seen that many in Colorado. I would tell you that they live in yards, city parks, coffee farms, and the rainforest. Because this bird, when it leaves here, it spends a different kind of life when it's down in the tropics. It will flock, it will eat, uh, you might see eight or 10 in the same binocular view sometimes. And that's why, how are we doing here? Now, now neither of them are working. <laughs> So anyway, my, so, so my talk is about boundaries and, and I, uh, I, the fact that there are no boundaries. And the Swainson's thrush, again, I highlight at the top. Uh, these these uh, numbers don't add up to 12. I kind of took them from eBird and I looked at the, the plots of when the birds are in certain parts of the world. And what you see, of course, and, and a lot of you know this, these birds actually spend a lot more of their lives south of here. And I, in fact, tend to say that they live in the tropics. They're tropical birds and they come up here for a romantic vacation. I mean, I don't see how, you know, if you're up here to ski for three months and the rest of your year you spend on the beach in Florida, where do you live? Okay, so let's again, look at, let's look at the boundaries as birds see them. Well, here's a couple common species uh, that are, um, live from here to there. In other words, they have a big range. You can find the American Dipper down in southern, uh, down in Panama, and that, actually, that picture, that hairy woodpecker was actually taken in southern Costa Rica. A couple other tropical birds, you recognize these as not birds of the Roaring Fork, a red-headed barbet, red-legged honeycreeper. Now they have a, uh, a life where they live in a fairly large uh, region, so their populations are, aren't doing so bad. But then there are others like these, the long-tailed silky flycatcher is essentially an endemic to part of Costa Rica and Panama, and the rose-bellied bunting lives in just a small area of Mexico. And I like this picture because it illustrates a lot of what I'm trying to say tonight, just in, in one handful. Uh, these are two birds taken from the same mist net. I was on a trip with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies in Jalisco. We were doing some mist netting, and one morning we got a calliope hummingbird on the left and a bumblebee hummingbird on the right. Now, the calliope hummingbird is the second smallest bird in the world. It is the smallest long-distance migrant. And I find it so interesting that in the same patch of flowers where we caught them, we have a bumblebee hummingbird, which is the third smallest bird in the world, and it's sedentary. It stays there, and the other one risks that big flight. So think about that as we think about where birds live and what their lifestyles are like. 
And obviously, you know, for my title, I'm going to talk about some bad news. And you've heard a lot of this before. Part of what I'm hoping to do is inspire you to double down on whatever it is you're doing, or if you're not doing much, to, to do more. Um, there's a, I'm going to talk about both these. That's palm oil factory on the left, and it's a pineapple plantation to be on, on your right. I could have found many graphics that talk about the state of birds. And again, I know I'm not telling you much because the last uh, couple of months, there's been that study that came out about the three billion birds that are missing in uh, North America. So many species that are on watch lists and risks of extinction. Just to punctuate that a little bit with local birds, uh, the barn swallow down by nearly half. Any data on here, by the way, is from the All About Birds website that Cornell operates. I show the purple martin, not necessarily that it comes down the valley, but uh, everybody talks about the Thompson Divide and that area up there. And if you go to that area and the contiguous national forest, the Gunnison, the Grand Mesa, about 80% of the western subspecies of the purple martin lives up there. And that's a species that may well be a separate species or certainly should have more distinction as a unique subspecies. Be studies just haven't been done. Um, Broad-tailed hummingbird, very familiar to all of us. Um, I'm gonna, I'll mention once or twice, we have some property at 8,300 feet kind of over the hill against the Grand Mesa National Forest. And you know, we talk about it among ourselves and I asked someone uh, earlier here Anecdotally, how do you feel about broad tails? You know, we used to, I'm sure we had 25, 30 on the porch. I even have it written down in our little notebook. Well, now it seems like I get 15, 20, it's still a lot. But again, according to their website, down 52%. Um, olive sided flycatcher, that's a favorite of most of us because if any birder knows a bird call, they usually know that one. The quick three beers and down 80%. Again, uh, a few more as I keep beating you with bad news. The sage thrasher, you go down in the sage steppe south of here. Tree swallow, which is more common of the birds that you have sailing around. You know, that's kind of like, uh, you know, it's spring when you're out and you hear some swallows twittering and so on. Uh, Wilson's warbler, you're down fishing in the creek or whatever, a little yellow flash. Columbia vireo, you get back in some of the drier areas, oaks and so on. The western wood peewee is one that it, it's really struck me, and I noticed the, uh, the state of the forest report out there talked about, they had a picture of sudden aspen decline, and our little patch of woods has had that. I don't know if that's the direct cause or not, but when we first uh, acquired the place, I would sit in the porch and I'd hear that, I'd hear that down slur, and I'd hear it all over. And then it seemed like last few years, um, where is it? You know, I can still find them, they're still there, but it's not like there's one pair here, pair there. Definitely, I, it's something I've seen. I'll come back to mountain bluebirds down by about a quarter. Um, <clears throat> and so about around a quarter of the birds are on lists that are sliding toward extinction. And I'm probably again telling you things you know. Whoops, uh oh, there we go. So why are they declining? Now these are, these are the way I list them. I'm not giving one more, uh, uh, you know, a higher priority than another. The first habitat loss, and I mean that's people, so many of us. Connectivity, we've done a terrible job of not connecting habitat, something that we need to go back and fix when we can and watch for. Uh, habitat loss because of climate, and I know you've really gotten a lot of that, and previous speakers about the pikas, brown cap, rosy finches. And then everything else, and uh, anybody remember what happened December 22, 2017? I'll come back to it, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. What happened to Olive Sided Flycatcher? I threw Common Nighthawk in here too. I don't know if anybody's ever come down to the Junior College World Series that they have in Grand Junction, and when I initially went to that 30 some years ago, we would see the Nighthawks all over, now you don't see any. Uh, uh, most people, if you go look at the studies, say it's due to decline in insect populations. And I had a good question last night because they said, well, we understand they're down in Europe where none of the habitat is intact, but we have intact habitat. Why are they down here? And I'm no expert on this. I'm only repeating things I read, but unusual weather events are really 
being blamed for that. If you think about it, and, and I think about my fruit trees, it seems like they're blooming earlier and there's a late frost later. So that's one of the things that may be uh, an effect that we hadn't thought of. Sage grouse is, of course, in the news around Colorado a lot, and I show this slide mainly to emphasize the habitat fragmentation problem. Now, there's a bird that doesn't want to, you know, doesn't fly very far, and it doesn't want to cross habitat that uh, uh, isn't good habitat for its particular need. For example, you could have some migrants that have some nice habitat here, and they'll fly over a city to have nice habitat there where a sage grouse can't do that. So if they're extirpated from an area, they can't recolonize. Now, a lot of our birds do not fall into that. An awful lot of tropical birds have that issue. And then there's the other one, and this is a, another way that I like to get into talking about fragmentation. You know, we go back a few years and there were many ornithologists out and, and listening and they would say, here's the size of a bird's territory. And so the thought was that we could save a spot that size and the birds would use it. And they found out the birds didn't use it. Originally it was thought this is predation because here's your little piece of habitat or subdivisions around, dogs and cats get in there, kids in their guns. And then there's also just the shyness factor. These birds are too shy. Well, a lot of that uh, research has been changed. I have a, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this book by Bridget Stutchberry. It's been out a decade or so and called Silence of the Songbirds. And I think it should be up there with Silent Spring. She's got a, uh, done some brilliant research, done some really hard work. And she's talked a lot about, uh, and looked at both tropical birds and uh, some of the migrants. And what she found, and this is the direct quote, most neotropical migrants are obsessed with extra pair sex. And we've all seen, if we're birders, we've seen those two birds chasing around, it's maybe something you've been looking for, and you think, well, why won't they land? Well, it's one male chasing another out of his territory. But, little as you know, it is female has maybe just accepted the guy from the other side or went out and found him herself. So if you have three eggs in a nest, you might have three dads. And what's, what Stutchberry and her people did is they climbed trees up and down, up and down, and they, they took DNA samples from, from nestlings, they misnetted all the birds in the area, and they, they documented this, and they documented and also came up with some good evolutionary ex reasons why our neotropical migrants do that. Uh, not all birds do, and if that interests you, get the book. But it also shows why you need larger habitat. That's really the point I wanted to make before I got off that slide, is that they nest colonially. So if you've got that habitat that's just the right size, and if you're obsessed with extra pair of sacks, you're too frustrated to use it. So that's what happens. All right, uh, here's a picture. And again, I'm going to go through some of my habitat reasons here. This is in, uh, near the Panamanian border, a place that I've uh, been at a number of times. This is a rice field. People need to eat, and what happened was that they had dug a big ditch, dried it out, planted rice. Behind it, palm oil. We'll talk about, a little bit more about that, palm oil plantation. And behind that, because the, sto the, the, the uh, slope is steep, they haven't cut those down yet. But again, that's a severe habitat loss issue. Oops, did it again, whatever it is, I, there we go. And I have a friend down there who used to work for the Bird Conservancy uh, many years ago, but uh, he writes a blog, and this is some quotes from it. He's a bird guide, so he's out pretty much every day. And he, the highlights are mine, not because I don't have to read all of it, but he talks about seeing and hearing fewer birds, ecosystem collapse. <clears throat> That's a, that's a pretty heavy term to use. It talks about prolonged hot, dry weather. And see, one of my beliefs is that it's tragic that the United States is a temperate climate simultaneous with being the major producer per capita of uh, the C CO2 and so on. Because, you know, even here, if it was the high could be, let's say next year on this date, maybe it could be 50-55. Two years from now, the high might be 10. That wouldn't surprise you. But when you talk about countries that have very defined wet and dry seasons, very defined temperatures, and they change just a little bit, 
you know, that effect is enormous. And I think that the fact that our temperate climate has, can vary so much has allowed people to kind of, you know, oh, well, we can deny change because it's always been crazy and it gets a little crazier. But here, we're looking at a place maybe where the temperature never has changed between 70 and 74 for a high. Now it's 74 and 78. That's a big difference. And I've found, you know, in the time that I've been lucky enough to go down in the tropics, that if you talk to people down there, and I'm talking about people on the street, they all say the weather's changed. They all know it's weather's changed because it always rained on May 10th, and now it didn't this year. Or it never rained in March, and now we got four inches last week and there was a flood. So uh, it's really different, and I think that might be an argument you can use if you know climate deniers because, uh, again, I think that uh, our temperate climate is given us an excuse that some people use. Now, I've got a few pictures just to show some extremes. This is on the Rio Napo in eastern Ecuador. And it's interesting to me that the dock's way up there and they tried to mark different heights. And, and you might also note all this stuff laying at the bottom here. And the re this was record drought during this time. It was the lowest they'd ever ex experienced with the river. And of course, one of the bigger problems is fossil fuel development. And they have these big barges going up and down the river. And again, you don't need to know too much river physics, but you got to stay in that deep part of the channel. Sometimes the deep part of the channel is along the bank. The wash from the barge hits the bottom of the bank, softens it, then the whole bank falls in. Mass wasting, that's called. Your river's now wider and shallower. And talking to the indigenous people there, they're all talking about how fish that used to be there aren't there anymore. The water quality's changed and so on. Here's the opposite extreme. We were on, the, this is in the Rio Madre de Dios in Peru. And for some reason, I've had the bad luck of hitting some freak weather. They had claimed right before we got there, like two days, that it was a generational storm. They'd never known such a storm. We were on a, a, going to a lodge that was up the river. There were no roads to it. And the uh, workers, who were again indigenous, had lived there for a long time. They had actually gotten out and hugged the pilings under the building. Trees came down, wrecked some of the buildings, wrecked the trails. They'd never seen anything like it. And even talking to those people, some who had never left the area, they knew about the United States that it was the number one producer of uh, per capita of uh, CO2, or at least of the emissions that uh, were blamed for crazy weather. One of the pictures showing gold dredges, which is another problem. Uh, it's illegal, it's done all, but it's done all over Amazonia, and, and because of the flood, it doesn't look as bad as it might have because, but they're pulling up the bottom and going through the sill, and it's a mess, and they're all over. Um, we happen to fly out over the river. Here's a place where there's not any problem. Here's a place where they're working the gold. So it's, it's terrible. And so I, I like to say, you know, if we had Valentine's a couple weeks ago, if you bought your sweetheart uh, cheap gold, uh, look for something else next year because, in, in fact, I happened to see this just a year ago that the drug cartels in Colombia make more off of the illegal gold mining. So gold does have some industrial uses, but I would submit that we burners should just let those be its only uses. Okay, one of the things, now that I get you good and depressed, um, this, this just, just showed up in the uh, magazine Bird Conservation of the American Bird Conservancy, which is a great organization. And I was struck by this. Uh, this is a, a part of that uh, page. And here, here is a list of some bird species, and it lists the declines. Evening grosbeak is a bird you probably know, down 90%. And my suggestion is, is if you lived in Evening Grosbeakville in uh, the Roaring Fork Valley, would you consider a 90% loss the apocalypse or, no, it's troubling. Well, what I found, and, and this is something I, I sort of want you to pick your word. Um, I, I had a, I've had discussions with people like uh, biologists and so on that work in a particular field, and I've gone up to them afterward and said, you kind of sugarcoated that, didn't you? Well, if I say it's so bad, then everybody won't, nobody will do anything. Well, I don't know. So what works for you? If Apocalypse says, ah, it's over, I can't, I give up, then it's troubling. You can still fix it. Or if Apocalypse is the word that gets you going, then pick that one. But we need to get the right semantics so that we act. It isn't over, but the thing is, is that uh, pick the word that will motivate you. 
Um, here's some data I took off of that All About Birds website. It's the only graph I'm going to show you. But uh, I took birds that they said had a 1.5% decline. This is since about 1970, 2.5, 3.5. Half. Um, a lot of these are familiar. Of course, there's that evening grow speak. And I like to think, too, when um, I was in college, if this is the evening gross beak population or the olive sided flycatcher population, it's now that. That's a lot. And there, what is the indication we have that those graphs are not still going down? We don't have that indication. Our only indication is, is this is still happening. At some point, we have to stop it because they're headed for zero. And it's going to be above zero that the population will collapse colonial nesters, etc. So the time is now. The time is now to do something. You know, we're kind of in this range, but, you know, if we don't change it, it's going to keep going. Well, why should you care? Well, I know I'm talking to a lot of birders here, but even here's some, maybe some food you can give to other people to think about. This, these data are the most recent, but 41 billion spent on gear. Uh, we all know how much those good binoculars cost. Uh, Colorado is a major destination. We have 500 plus species in this state. If you, apart from places like Texas and Alaska, some coastal states, Colorado's a biggie. And I make the joke about chicken tours because people come to see ptarmigan and grouse and all those kinds of things. I've had people come to the West Slope. We have nine species of owls in the Grand Valley. And so I've, I've had entertained uh, birders from Sweden, for example, and, and uh, or from around the country. Uh, ecosystem services, well, all those tropical birds that come here for their romantic vacation, they're coming because there's lots of bugs. And so if those bug consumers don't come here, what are we going to do? Are we going to have cottonwood trees with no leaves? Are we going to douse ourselves in more pesticides? Birds are critical to our lives. And of course, recreation, if I'm talking to mountain bikers or whoever, it's more pleasant. Is that if there's nice habitat around? Of course it is. This one uh, is an interesting one. I, I, I like to talk about it too because when I was in college, if you'd ask me what's Lyme disease, I wouldn't have known. And I'm going to bet all the younger folks in here all have heard of Lyme disease all their lives. So what's changed? Well, people have tried to figure that out. Now, again, I'm not an expert on this. I can tell you what I read. And there's a number of people that believe that the most abundant bird, this part's true, the most abundant bird in the late 1800s was a passenger pigeon. Man and his hubris wiped it out. Now, what, was it, what did it eat for a large part of its year? It ate acorns. All those acorns now are on the ground. Deer mice eat the acorns. They're a part of the vector, typically, for the spread of the Lyme parasite. And so there are people who suggest, at least, that maybe we wiped out the passenger pigeon, and that's why Lyme disease became a thing. You know, you go back, uh, the great ecologist Aldo Leopold, you know, he said if you're going to tinker, he was talking about ecosystems, the best thing to do is save all the parts. We haven't been doing that. So we get rid of other things at our peril. Okay, what can you do? I'm going to go through these a bit. Um, I talk about visiting tropical countries. You know, I've had people right away say, well, you know, there's the carbon of the plains. Yeah, that's an issue. And there's some elitist things about perhaps being able to pay for carbon offsets or whatever. But I can tell you this, if we don't go see what's in the trees, they're going to cut the trees down. So that is something that's important. You know, you have to go and show that value. I'll come through some of the others. Coffee, and again, I'm probably talking to everybody knows, but are you a real pain in the butt about it? Does every place you go, do you say, why isn't it organic? Or do you go to the next place if there's not organic or shade-grown coffee? And you can see the structure, the layers, and so on of this coffee plantation in, in uh, Costa Rica. And that took that picture, that lessons Mot Mot, which lives in other habitats too. But it was there looking for some bugs that might be eating the coffee. Uh, pineapple. Pineapple, as it's grown in Central America, this is how you prepare it. You strip all the land, and then you lay out a bunch of plastic pipe. It looks like a hydroponics operation. And then you don't do enough so the the chemicals can run off and so on. It's horrible. Um, I, 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 we've been there a lot. We've taken other people down, and a lot of people that we know and ourselves do not eat pineapple if we can't find it organic. I don't know about other parts of the world how it's grown, but it's certainly horrific the way it's done down there. 
palm oil. I do a palm oil presentation. Uh, I've got a film and you just can drive for miles and miles and miles. And it looks just like that. And there's uh, the thing with pineapple and palm oil. The profits leave the country pretty much. And at least the studies I've seen all show that there were more jobs per acre or hectare uh, when they were doing their farming or the more of the, in, the indigenous or local agriculture. Palm oil is a tough one to get hold of. I brought up the idea of the icing. If you uh, go and buy that uh, icing at the store, you, sometimes some of them, the number one ingredient is palm oil. But, you know, being, being a little bit of a, of a cook, I work with my grandkids a lot, uh, we ice things. Well, you can take a little confectioner, sugar, water, and vanilla. It tastes the same, but the texture is different. Most of the palm oil in food is for texture. That's why I brought up granola bars. If your granola bar does a nice snap, well, it probably doesn't have palm oil in it. Some nice soft ones and chewy ones, that's palm oil. So think about it. It tastes the same. Maybe you can do with a little difference in texture. Um, I want to mention that I, I have a handout, and I don't have very many. I have uh, some, some uh, links and so on that you can learn more about this or get involved in it. And I also have some laminated sheets my wife will pass around. You can take a picture with your phone or something if you uh, want to look at some of that stuff. Uh, back to palm oil. You really hear about it in Asia most because of the fires, because of, you may be seeing the thing with the orangutan and the bulldozer and all that. But in this, the Americas, it's really severe. Maybe this, the amount is smaller. Uh, and if you've been to Costa Rica much, you probably, it, 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 back 10 years or more, you may well have gone to El Tigre Marsh. Well, it's been drained and now it's palm oil. A lot of companies will sign a no deforestation pledge and then buy the land and bring it in after somebody's burned and logged it. Or what about wetlands? So we, we can't avoid it, but you know, it's increasing and increasing and increasing. And so somehow or other, if consumers don't get into that a little bit, it's just going to get worse and it's devastating. That's the only thing I can say about it. Okay, another quiz. Uh, not the birds, but what species are in these pictures? This is my... Pardon? Well, no, not the birds. <laughs> That's right. It's a long-eared owl, and it's in a tamarisk, tamarisk thicket. These are cedar waxwings chowing down on, on uh, berries that are in uh, Russian olive. And this is what I'm talking about, getting local involvement. There's a lot going on in this state, a lot going on. Uh, a lot of this we got into locally around uh, Mesa County because parks and wildlife, the city parks, county, oh, there's tamarisk and there's Russian olive, we've got to cut it down because it's, uh, it's an invasive. And the thing is that, and I, what I want to say is, stop equating non-native with nefarious. But what I want you to understand is, don't go and say that we had this speaker who said, that this is better than native habitat or as good as native habitat. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is the projects as they're now done are often done, I want to say mostly done, very badly. Because when you talk about tamarisk retaining 75% of the species, and this is data that the Forest Service has taken over the years, the 25% that are missing are the cavity nesters primarily. So now let's go cut this down to the ground. Now we've removed 100% of the birds. And that's basically what's happening. Now, if there's money for good restoration, for follow-up, all that kind of stuff, great. And I've heard people now talking about doing it in patches where they'll maybe take out one patch and when the native vegetation is up, then they can take out the next patch of non-natives, great. But don't go in and extirpate all the birds, and that's what's been happening. Uh, tamarisk especially has hurt us bad. I know a lot of you may know Kim Potter. She's worked with us with owls for years, and she always likes to say, where you don't want to go or can't go, that's where the long-eared owls are. Well, 20, 25 years ago, I could have taken you this time of year and probably shown you 10 or 12 because they would communally nest. But between the uh, eradication of tamarisk and the tamarisk beetle, which has taken the leaves off of a lot of it and made them vulnerable, vulnerable to predation, we don't hardly see any long-eared owls anymore. And the same thing, uh, there's cedar waxwings eating it, uh, wood ducks. Uh, at one of our uh, Connected Lakes State Park, the wood ducks were always jumping up and getting the berries. It was really fun to watch them, and the state came down, cut it all down. So. Get involved in your local projects. If you hear something like 
there's going to be habitat improvement, find out what it is. You know, a lot of times the park managers can be helped by the public telling them we've got to do restoration different. Or if you're going to give me six months of money to cut things down, make sure I have five or ten years of money, which is a lot less money needed, but you need it for a long time, to make sure the restoration sticks, because a lot of times it doesn't. Okay, that date I gave you in 2017, I can still remember sitting on my couch. It's Friday night. It's Christmas weekend, and I read what they've done to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And uh, the analogy I use, uh, I see everybody's uh, is, is kind of looking at me, so nobody's out there probably with a flask getting drunk. But the way they changed the act is, is that if you were drunk and staggered out of here and crossed the center line, well, right now you would be criminally prosecuted. But the way they changed the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is if you didn't intend to do it. In other words, I'm going to get drunk and that's the way I'm going to go out and kill somebody you had intent, then that would be the only way you'd be prosecuted. So what they've done again is just any, you don't even have to worry about it. You know, that's well, a waste pit. Obviously I have a waste pit because I needed a waste pit. I didn't do it to kill birds. Well, at least they had to think about it before. They might have to put a net. They might have to do some scaring, whatever. Uh, all the funds that, with the Exxon Valdez, with the BP uh, cleanups, a large part of that fund was because of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So when I talk about local involvement, that means we got to vote. We got to change this. This is one of the huge ones. Another one I like to bring up, the term conservation dependent. That bothers me. And I admit I'm a purist. And I got bluebirds up there. Remember I had this slide that said they're down by about a quarter? Well, the reason they're only down by about a quarter is because of great volunteers. There are people in, in my neighborhood that run hundreds of boxes. There's some routes that they've taken, they've got data for more than 10 years. They've fledged thousands of bluebirds. And this is happening all over the country. So without that, the bluebird population decline would be a lot greater. And I kind of maintain that the Kirtland's warbler and the black cap vireo were taken off the Endangered Species Act, a species list, more for political reasons. For one thing, the money that went to cowbird trapping control birds was paid for by federal money. In both of these cases, it looks like states and NGOs have stepped up and they will continue. But I don't know if a bird is truly uh, off the, the risk of extinction when humans have to be that involved in its lifestyle to keep it going. And you know, we do a lot. And I think this, this group probably, I don't have to say this to, but I think in the public at large does not realize how important volunteer work is in keeping a lot of species going. It's huge. And if, you know, there's many, many ways it can be done, but I think that is a, an underappreciated uh, fact, how much help so many species need. Well, I am going to give you good news. Uh, this is Scarlet Macaw. I hadn't even thought about it when I made the slide, but when I, when I initially went to Costa Rica in the 80s, I thought I was seeing the last of them. But by enforcing their laws really well, the scarlet macaw has actually expanded in the country. Um, <clears throat> this is an interesting area. This is the Santa Marta region in Colombia. The journal Science, which probably a lot of you know, which is arguably the most prestigious journal in, in one of their articles, they called this area the most irreplaceable site on Earth of all protected areas worldwide. And uh, there were threats for deforestation and agriculture. And what happened was, is that people like us, whatever, got enough money together and it was bought. Uh, this is on the north coast of Colombia, right next to where, uh, north coast of South America, north coast of Colombia, right next to Venezuela. Um, Santa Marta parakeet, which there's about a thousand left, Santa Marta brush finch. You start to get the theme there. So many birds, you say, oh, that's a Santa Marta this and a Santa Marta that. But if you look at the bird list, there are 18 North American warblers on their bird list as well. Uh, I, have a, I use this Canada warbler because I had a good picture of it, but the warblers that you see in the North Fork Valley have all been, several of them have been seen there anyway, Wilson's warbler in particular. So when you save, you see something and they say, oh, you need money to save the Santa Marta this or whatever, when you're saving that bird, you're saving, you're saving the birds in your backyard at the same time. Think back to where I was talking about those birds and where they come and where they live. Well, that's why it's important to save some of those places. 
And again, we need islands of habitat. This is more Santa Marta parakeet because the Swainson's thrush is, is actually a bird that winters there and it's going to come back up here. It's got to have some islands along the way to fatten up. So we have to look at that whole chain. But again, don't think that these places, when you hear about them in Central and South America, are something exotic that, oh well, I wish I could help that. Well, if you want to help that, you're helping here at the same time. And also, you don't know what you're going to protect. Um, this is from uh, uh, some mountains in Jalisco, and if you've the, this area was saved from, uh, by birds, because of birds, and then it turned out they found Tailcinte there, which is the progenitor of all corn. So it seemed like we wouldn't want to throw away the DNA, the, the, you know, what's involved in the progenitor of all corn, and that plant was almost wiped out. And I, I believe that uh, they told us this was the only natural uh, place for it that they knew of at the time, now that's since been spread out and saved a few other places. But when you save a bird, you might be saving something like that, something that has a genetic history that we would never want to lose. Whoops, I did it again, whatever it is. And again, I said it was safe for the birds. This is the endangered black cap vireo. It happens to be a female, but we captured that there when we were doing the mist netting. Well, again, we are not doomed. We really aren't. Here's a story I like. This fellow here is named Diego. The bird on the right is a Hokotoko ant pitta. And it turns out, uh, the way I, I, I sort of made this up, but I think when Diego was probably about 15, he lived in this little village right near the Peruvian border in Ecuador. And he probably was looking at, I mean, he's not educated, doesn't speak English. I think he was probably looking at, well, maybe I can get a cow, maybe I can get a little pot of corn. And then in 1997, the Hokotoko ant pitta was discovered. And the people looked at this and they said, oh my gosh, there's almost no habitat. I hope you can tell from this, a lot of Western Ecuador is really sad. Western Southern Ecuador, you see slides, you see it's denuded. Um, you know, sadly, people are trying to get by. I mean, that's, you can't really blame them, but a lot of this area gets cut and then it gets eroded, the soil erodes, and then you don't have really anything to, that's productive. It's hard to take a picture of cloud forest but uh, there's this reserve because of the Hokotoko ant pit. It's just this beautiful lush cloud forest. Well, it's preserved. Why? Again, people like us, whatever, gave money and it was purchased. And what that also did is that they needed some jobs. So Diego is a ranger there and uh, he fixes trails, he fixes um, you know, the parts of the building. And of course he learned to love birds and he got good at it. So if somebody shows up, we were independent travelers. We didn't have a guide. So he was our guide for a couple of days. Well, so we went through the reserve. It's called the Tapachalaca Reserve. And we did pretty good. And then he, he suggested we go down to his hometown. And there's a little area there. Uh, there's a, some ruins. It's supposedly the first place that cacao was cultivated for you chocophiles out there. And uh, so that's where he grew up. And I didn't know I was going to use these pictures, so they aren't real great. Here's Diego, and there was some good birding there. And I want you to notice on the right here is the ruins, but on the left here is this little pavilion, and there's a little poster there. And you get a little closer. And he would talk to me about it a little bit, and I finally got the story of it. Again, you can see that the poster, maybe you can tell there, is birds. And let's see, back up here a little, whoops. This is a river. And even though this area is heavily cultivated, this steep hillside's got a lot of nice trees. It's really a great little birding spot. And through what he's learned and what he's become interested in, he built the pavilion and he got this poster with his pictures and so on and brought that back to his little hometown where it's probably they had no one who had ever had an idea about birds or that you could work in birds or whatever. And that's, to me, the kind of success story that we can really hang on. You know, we, we bought that, somebody did, and I've got a link in here. In fact, uh, they're looking for more land that they can buy near there, and it's, it's less than $500 an acre. Um, the Hokotoka Foundation actually got more money than they expected, so they have 15 reserves. That sounds good but it's only 57,000 acres. I mean, these are very important reserves. And right now, like I said, you can go on their website and you can buy an acre for $484, I think. So anyway, 
I like to end. Uh, this is a favorite place of mine in Costa Rica on the Osa Peninsula, uh, one of the most biodiverse diverse areas there. And if we can all work together, we won't let the sun set on our wildlife. So that's my talk. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to entertain any questions or comments. Uh, shade grown coffee is so well I, I th that particular coffee farm has about 300 species on their bird list and there's a bird guide in the family one of the reasons it's that high and the shade coffee I always like to compare it to a soybean field if you've seen those back in the Midwest where you have a plants this height no trees just as far as you can see so the difference is, is really quite remarkable uh, Pete Mara, I heard him, he's the lead conservation biologist for the Smithsonian. I heard him say in a speech that the single most important thing people in North America could do is to, for tropical birds or the neotropical migrants is to drink organic or shade grown coffee. She's heard me talk so much, she knows when I forgot something. <laughs> Anything else? To me, fairly overwhelming and depressing that we have a government uh, or U.S. government right now that's uh, opening up national property to mining and drilling and getting rid of gutting Endangered Species Acts, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, uh, how how does one counter that sort of overwhelming? Um, exasperation. Well, I, you know, there's, there's sort of two levels for me, and I think everybody has to do this personally. And, I, you know, if I do any good in a talk like this, I hope that I can find something that fits you. You know, that's why I was trying to look for different words or whatever. You know, if just doing a little thing like drinking the right coffee helps you feel like you're doing something, that is important. The other thing I think if, is buy land. You know, that's one thing that they probably can't come and take. You know, there are a number of groups out there that take most of the money you send them. Uh, and like I said, I have some links and there are many other out there. Yeah. Yeah, if you can take a picture of that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a way you can feel like, hey, I, that is a direct thing I did. I saved some habitat. Um, is it ever going to be enough? I don't know what's going to be enough, but we have to do something. So that's how I feel okay. I mean, I. Those things you said make me feel horrible. So, like I said, I didn't sleep that night when I saw that about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. I've, I've worked in industry or around it enough, and I've seen enough sins and so on. So, yeah, that's depressing. But you you gotta you gotta be involved. You know, if we don't do it, no one will. So, yes. What's your favorite bird and why? Well. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually pretty easy because uh, I have this Western Screech Owl project. We have over 200 boxes in the Grand Valley, and um, we get about, uh, we have like 20 some owl routes every morning, every Christmas count in the morning. We go out all day with cameras and look in all the boxes. We're number one in Western Screech Owls almost forever. <laughs> and uh, I meet a lot of great people. I have a lot of fun with those owls. So I have to give Western Screech Owl my. That's what's gotten me uh, to meet a lot of great people and all that. So you should come down and join our Christmas count. Um, uh, there's a number of people who do. I mentioned Kim Potter. She's part of it. Uh, there's a number of people in Roark Fork Audubon, uh, you know, Tom and Kay McConnell, Jennifer Long. So come on down. In fact, on May 29th, if you want to remember that, we have our Western Screech Owl Banding Day. And that's a lot of fun. We bring the owls down, and they're right here. You can get pictures of them and so on. Uh, watch our website, Grand Valley Audubon website, May 29th. That's a great opportunity because, like I said, you get those owls right here. And uh, if you decide to come, let me know. And, uh, but anyway, you just come, come to that. That one was easy. Some picking some of the tropical birds is a little harder. <laughs> Do 
do you get, I want to ask, do you get some local projects like I talked about there where you've looked at them and said, my gosh, why did they take out all the habitat? Does that happen up here much or in the valley? Tamarisk, for sure. Yeah. You just need to make sure, you know, again, I'm not trying to say tamarisk is a, is a wonderful plant, but it's better than uh, knapweed or loose strife or whatever you end up with afterwards way too much. Rebecca? On that same, I know. <laughs> um, on that same uh, sort of wavelength, do you have any thoughts on, um, I guess it's like uh, fire mitigation where they're taking out all sorts of understory, um, well, that, that, that's, that's a huge problem. I mean, what we've done is made ourselves visible so that the parks and um, those people, when they have a project, will at least consult with us. That doesn't always help because that, that may be that there's a homeless camp that they want to get rid of. They may think there's too fire risk. One of the problems that's really been bad uh, in talking about Western Screech Owls is the park people have tree risk guys who walk through up oh, that tree's a risk that tree's a risk and they have to go a lot of those are the nest trees i don't have an answer to that other than to make yourself visible so that you are at the table because if you're not they won't pay any attention to it they won't even think about it i think we've made a difference in some cases but yeah some cases it's now well, we're going to do it anyway but you're right that is an issue But, you know, that's something that costs you some time, but they do need to hear from us. They, uh, I've, many times I've had different of those folks say, well, gosh, we never heard from birders before. Um, you know, we kind of are quiet and all that, and they don't know how many of us there are. <laughs> well, any other questions? All right, well, thanks for coming to the Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>